So good afternoon and welcome to all of you who've joined the session this afternoon. Um, my name is John Paul Way. I'm better known as uh, JP and I'm one of the managing directors in HSBC's UK banking team. I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by Philip, who's Vice President of Global Treasury Operations at Unilever. So I think as we all know, sustainability and ESG more generally is a topic that's clearly front of mind for us all. This is one of six sessions at the ACT conference that have an ESG focus. And from my perspective, ESG and sustainability forms part of almost every client conversation that's now being held. The specific focus for this session is on the benefits and challenges of sustainable treasury investments. I think it's fair to say that much of the initial ESG focus was around sustainable financing, including sustainable bonds and sustainable loans. However, sustainable investments are now rapidly coming into focus. And from HSBC's perspective, I thought it just worth mentioning a couple of facts. So at the moment, approximately 90% of HSBC asset management's 612 billion of asset, assets under management are classified as responsible investments. Last year, HSBC Asset Management announced the formation of a joint venture with Pollination, which is focused on climate asset management. The initial launches include a natural capital fund and then an additional nature-based carbon strategy fund. Later on this summer, in, res in response to you know, client demand and client conversations, we're launching a range of ESG specific money market funds. And we've also launched green deposit solutions in a number of different geographic locations around the world. As I've already mentioned, it's great that Philip is joining me for the discussion today. Philip, why don't you introduce yourself and give a short summary on Unilever's sustainability history and the current focus and strategy before we start our discussion? Yeah, sure, JP. Thanks and good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're dialing in. A uh, pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, where should I start? Maybe, maybe just a very quick intro. So I'm, I'm heading up Unilever's Treasury Operations globally, which includes the dealing room with short-term short debt issuance and also investments. Uh, we're obviously a net debt company, so we're not kind of our reason to exist is not necessarily purely in investing. Um, but of course, we do have surplus cash from time to time, especially if we divest parts of our business, etc., like we have done on occasion in the past. Um, so, so that question is, has become more and more relevant um, as, kind of, as we cycle through periods of uh, surplus cash in the center in particular. In terms of Unilever's uh, sustainability journey, and I'm 24 years roughly in Unilever and different finance roles, um, and I've been in Treasury now for, for four years in my current uh, operations uh, responsibility. I was previously also in Treasury in the financial crisis. So it seems when I'm in Treasury, there seems to be some sort of crisis around whether it's a financial crisis or the COVID pandemic and, and kind of what that means to us. But anyway, so in terms of sustainability, you know, this is close, close to the heart of Unilever. You know, when you ask our sustainability team, they have a very nicely prepared response that says, you know, the DNA of Unilever is about sustainability. You know, Lord, Lord Lever has been actively engaging in improving living and hygiene conditions kind of for the workers, um, you know, more than 100 years ago in the northwest of England. They even call it the slums of north, northwest England, which I find interesting. You know, <laughs> certainly a different century and a long time ago. And, you know, we, we updated that and brought that to life um, in 2010 um, when we kind of created Universe 21st Century Purpose, making sustainable living commonplace uh, out of that uh, DNA, if I can call it that. And, and, and that drove the creation of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, uh, which has been in effect from 2010 to 2020. And we've been reporting on it like we have been reporting on our financial results every year. And, and that was built on the belief that, that business growth should not be at the expense of people and planets, which I think is very close in spirit to kind of what, what ESG means. And, and you know, the, the three big goals that we had set ourselves were around kind of doubling the business, uh, half the environmental footprint and improve health and well-being of, of one billion people. And, and that was kind of underpinned by measurable commitments uh, along different aspects, whether it's health, hygiene, nutrition, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, water consumption, you know, packaging use, gender equality, inclusive business. So it's just quite a, quite a long list of KPIs, a lot of them directly tying into the SDGs. 
And then this year, you know, after the 10 years of the USLP, we've launched the Compass uh, strategy uh, fairly recently, and I think in March externally this year. And the Compass is basically an integrated sustainable business strategy. Uh, so we grow by delivering a sustainable strategy. So it's, it's, it's the sustainability angle is now fully embedded in, in our business strategy. And, and, and that's built on the belief that kind of companies with purpose last, uh, brands with purpose grow and people with purpose thrive. Um, and then out of that, we, we have then drawn different commitments. Um, one is kind of the, the 1 billion euro climate and nature funds uh, that we have put up where over a period of 10 years, we'll be investing 1 billion euros uh, to kind of to, to fight climate change and to regenerate nature. Uh, and to preserve our resources. There's been a recent announcement about Dove uh, sponsoring some rainforest um, uh, reforestation mm -hmm. um, in Indonesia uh, that we have committed to. And so, so I think, sorry, maybe two, two more um, global aspects. And I'm kind of I'm trying to stay to my script because I'm talking on behalf of our sustainability team. You know, after all, I'm, a, I'm working in treasury. Um, but the two main goals that are important to mention and they, they have a lot of detail underneath, but the top goals are that, that we in our operations, so scope one and two emissions, um, we want to have a zero CO2 emissions by 2030. And, and the ambition is uh, in, a, in the medium term to reduce by 70% uh, by 2025, and then to be net zero, including scope three emissions, which is our supply chain. So the suppliers um, upstream and also our yeah. distribution downstream. Uh, to be net zero by 2039. And, and of course, to, just to bring it back to, to Treasury now, um, of course, what that means is that every function, every division, every market is working towards that integrated sustainable strategy of the compass and it's kind of a guiding North Star, let's say, uh, how we want to drive business. And, you know, that, that gives Treasury the license and also maybe the obligation to, to figure out how we can contribute um, towards that agenda. How can we make a difference? How can we have positive impact? Uh, so maybe that's why I come back to the initial question. Um, why sustainable investing? Why is that relevant? So maybe I'll, I'll pause here and then see what you have to say to that, JP. No, thanks, Philip. Look, look I think it's it's fair to say you you know with the you leave a sustainable living plan already having finished as the first part, you know having been put in place in 2010. I think you're well ahead of well ahead of the game there, and it's it's interesting. And you you covered it, you know, in some of the comments you were just making there. But how how does Treasury really fit into the overall, or how, or how does the ESG policy really fit into the overall Treasury uh, Treasury strategy? Yeah. The, you know, as, as a team, we sat down, what, year and a half, two years ago to, to think about kind of what's, what's our purpose, you know, what's the reason of existence in the organization. And, you know, to us, we defined it as kind of we're the guardians of cash and debt on behalf of the group. And, and we manage the financial risks for the group uh, to enable the group to focus on doing what they need to do so the business can actually go and achieve the ambition that it has. And, and then, and and part of our purpose, we need then look at what are the values that are driving what we do. I think pioneering is one of our core values. Um, you know, yeah. again, looking back to Lord Lever, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually quite fun, you know. So we, we we're constantly looking around us. And then Treasury is very externally focused, of course. And, and that, that gives us lots of stimulus and insights and ideas. What could we be doing better? Uh, how can we become a little better every day? And, you know, I think that's, that fits nicely with our kind of relationship approach to banking, you know, because we've worked with our top relationship banks and of course, HSBC is one of them, uh, disclaimer at this stage. Um, you know, we've worked together for a long, long time. I'll, uh, I'll so ignore that at this stage, I think, <laughs> Philip. <laughs> well, I remember we celebrated our, our 100th year anniversary but almost a decade ago now or something like that. So anyway, uh, we've been working together for a long time and, and for a good reason, JP. But, but of course, what it also allows us is to, to challenge our, our, our partner banks to say, come up with something that's relevant. You know, we were trying to figure out how can we as Treasury contribute positively to the agenda. Um, and, and of course, you know, when you, when you wind the clock back two years, there were not that many green deposit solutions out there or sustainable investments or however you want to call them. Um, so we actually had to push our partners and say, "Hey, we'd like this. Can you come up with a solution?" Um, so was that so, when you was that when you first had your first sustainable investment back in two years ago? 
2019? Yeah, roughly that. I mean, we, you know, we, we had our first green bond in, in Sterling in 2014. So we were kind of to, to the point of pioneering. You were one of the first corporates to issue a green bond uh, with kind of with the pain that that brought at the time. Um, but, but we definitely have an appetite and it's, it's in our values to kind of to pioneer and improve and, and pave the way. And so in 2019, we, we had our first ESG deposits with, with one of our relationship banks. And, and over the course of the last, call it, call it two years, um, we've scaled that up to kind of nine of our relationship banks are, are able to provide um, uh, such a product. Uh, and, and the journey has been kind of a little bit, well, not bumpy, shall I say, but, you know, we, we, we had to ask for it in some instances. And then it, it, it wasn't so easy for banks to come up. I mean, we, I think later on, we're going to come to some of the challenges. So I won't kind of spoil it here. Um, Maybe. But, but it's, it's, it's been a prominent topic. Well, I think that's always that's always one of the challenges you come come across when you're a pioneer in, in the investor there. So, I mean, just focusing specifically on the on the investments, Philip. You know, how do you how do you and, and the team at Unilever evaluate the different sustainability focused investment opportunities that are, that are available? I guess in particular. You know, we want. How, how do you make sure that these aren't just greenwash products, and that, that these are actually real sustainable or, or ESG-linked investments? Yeah, it's, I think that's that's a key point you're making here. You know, the, the whole objective of this is not to put a green stamp and to post something nice on LinkedIn and kind of feel good about it. The, the main objective is to have positive impact, and then to use every, any, and every opportunity where we can credibly have a positive impact. And and therefore, it's quite important that that is not just uh, kind of a, a certain asset base that you kind of the you know the investment gets linked to loosely uh, you don't really know where your money ends up then then of course how would you feel comfortable claiming that that is a green investment or a green deposit you know you wouldn't know mm. um and of, and of course th th there is an absence of of standards to judge so so you know our banks have taken different approaches i think the ultimate test for us was to say do we feel comfortable that the money that we are investing ends up supporting what it is supposed to to support and then of course the different banks have come up with different assurance processes around it sometimes with an independent third party opinion saying okay here's how the the, the pool of green loans has been ring fenced and here's how they they're linked into the kind of the green deposits that some of the clients are, yeah. are kind of are placing into that pool uh, and then there's a degree of reporting around it and uh, but of course the kind of the devil is in the detail because when you kind of you're innovating these solutions so different banks come up with different governance assurance visibility reporting etc so we yeah. just have to kind of work together uh, put resource behind it work together and see okay are we comfortable yes or no and, and unfortunately this is it's not a push of the button type solution because different people have taken different approaches and it's also been, I think, challenging for the banks um, in order to come up with this kind of product. No, I completely agree. I mean, let, let's, they we're talking about ESG deposits, but in a, in a negative euro rate environment, I know that caused us some particular challenges as well. Uh, I know what, one thing that we've talked about before, actually, is that when you, hmm. when you and the team analyze the, the investment opportunities, that almost the acid test, I think you mentioned, was... I said, would you would you be comfortable if the deposit, the investment that you'd made, actually became public? And I think if you if you use that lens to look at all of those all the different investments and deposits you're making, I think that's a pretty good starting place. You just, I agree. Just building on building on that a little bit more, Philip. How do how do you see ESG focused solutions, or have ESG focused solutions? You know, already fitted into your your typical and your standard treasury investment policy. <laughs> Another good question. Um, you know, if, if I'm totally honest, we're actually currently revisiting um, that part of our treasury policy that speaks to what what principles do we want to apply when it when we talk about investing surplus cash. So we're rewriting or redrafting our policy also as a result of the work we've done over the past two years and then the innovation that we have, have been able to deliver. Um, but, but of course, you know, and I think somebody else, I was listening into some of the other uh, events of the course of today um, on, on the ICT platform. And I think somebody else has already mentioned that, you know, we as treasurers, 
you know, we want to make sure we get our money back, right? So, so, so we, we, how we have to find that, we have to find that as SLY, SLY principles, so safety first. So we want to make sure that the money we put in is also the money we can get out when we want to have it out. Then second is liquidity. So it needs to be liquid. You know, it doesn't, it, it shouldn't be locked away for six months because we may want it uh, in two, three, five, six weeks, uh, whenever it is. Yeah. And only then do we care about yields. So it's, it's the principal purpose is not to optimize the yields. The principal purpose is, okay, we have surplus cash from time to time. Let's make sure we place it somewhere where it's safe, where it's liquid if we need it, because it's temporary in nature, and, and where the yield is okay-ish, shall I say. Um, and then, of course, in terms of the policy now, the question is, well, do you add on a fourth criterion, which is kind of, okay, is it sustainable? Is it green? Is it ESG? Uh, but, but we're probably going to take that on, kind of tackle that the other way around to say, wherever possible, we will seek to invest our surplus cash in an ESG instrument. Yeah. As long as it, you know, we're comfortable using it, as long as it, it, it can drive positive impact, and as long as it's kind of reasonably competitive. I mean, to your earlier point on yield, you know, what we found is that often as you innovate, we, you know, we may have to take a certain yield dilution com compared to a kind of planned vanilla type uh, investment product, planned vanilla yeah. bank deposit, bank firm deposit. And, and for the sake of the innovation and getting things off the ground, that's fine. You know, we, we haven't been too religious about it. The, the amounts are also typically not too material uh, as you start off in the overall scheme of things. But then obviously at some point you... It's a difficult conversation, you know. I don't want to end up having a discussion with the group treasurer of Unity or with our CFO or Graham to say, "Hey, are you okay if I invest everything in ESG deposits, but if it's going to cost me ten bips of yield dilution, and based on the notional, that's going to cost us five, ten, twenty million of of lost interest income? Are you okay with that?" That's not how I want to frame it. Um, and 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 thankfully, you know, after kind of the two year journey that we've been on, you know, we've we've ramped up our capacity significantly you know, literally hundreds of millions capacity to invest in ESG, uh, which is great. Um, and at some point we had 50% of our surplus cash invested in, in ESG instruments. So, okay. so we've been able to get it from small minor amounts to, to a significant scale, which is great. Um, and on aggregates, of course, it depends on which bank is offering what rates, depending on the appetite, depending on whether the asset pool is closed or not. So there are some kind of operational nuances. But on aggregates, we have now seen that similar to sustainability-linked bonds, some sort of a greenium, however small it is. So at least we don't face the penalty anymore at an aggregate level, which is great. But, it, but typically, it's, it's been dilutive at the start, and we had to kind of to, to work through the innovation and then try and get it to a point where, where the yield is roughly competitive, shall I say. It's an interesting scenario because we're on the... On the fundraising side, definitely there's a benefit for anybody who's raising funds in a green or sustainability linked um, method at the moment. And hence, of course, it means that the returns you can achieve on that are commensurately lower. So it's, 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 you know, it's definitely an interesting balance that, that, that exists there at the moment. But um, good to hear how, you, how you're not actually developing a fourth leg there. And it's just forming part of the policy, which yeah. is exactly in line with your principles, I think. So apart from yield as a potential trade-off what, what other challenges have have you and the team seen you know if you've been looking at it for a couple of years what are the challenges that you've seen over over the last couple of years when you're when you're looking at the, the ESG or green investments yeah so I think first of all it's you know, challenge the banks to come with the relevant products and then have commit the resource to co-develop and get something off the ground um, so, so you have, there needs to be a degree of commitment to, to go after this and get it done and then you need to have some resource to do that. So kind of the, the kind of the ops team, the, the front office team um, that reports into me, I've been quite busy on this, yeah. um, which is good, but it, it was a conscious choice. But, but aside from that, you know, the, the nature of our surplus central cash, as I said earlier, you know, we, we are a net debt company, but we do have cash from time to time, but ideally we don't have it for extended periods of time because it's pretty inefficient, um, you know, especially if <laughs> at the negative rates right now. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a balance of cash in the center and, and, and cash in the markets, uh, you know, and there's a difference. So, so the currency was one challenge. You know, it's, it, it seems to be easier for the banks to offer us a solution in euro, sterling or in dollars. Uh, but when we ask for Indian rupees or Philippine peso or Vietnamese dong, it gets more tricky. 
Uh, but these are also countries where we do have cash in between dividend remittances. You know, we're sitting on extended kind of amounts of cash for some time. You know, some markets you can only pay a dividend once a year, maybe twice a year. Uh, so, so there is cash in our local markets. Um, so, so having solutions there is, is welcome. But of course, then you open the can of local regulatory differences and, and ability to deliver product in, in the local market context. Yeah. Um, but but I'm, I'm very happy to say that we've been able um, with yourselves, but also another bank to, to have a solution in India. I think we've just placed the first one in Vietnam last week, if I'm we have, informed yeah. well. So you know that, that's, that's just fantastic to kind of to be able to take it into other currencies. Uh, and, and maybe the last one is, um, you know, that there was at the start, there was quite a duration discussion. You know, this needs to be a minimum of 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. Because otherwise, some, you know, the banks couldn't find a way to, to ring fence appropriately and to make sure you match it. Because the nature of the loans, of course, is the green loans that the bank is giving, obviously, long, longer term. Mm -hmm. and, and the nature of, of, of our surplus cash is a shorter term. So how do you match that, that duration delta uh, in a way that allows us to invest in, in shorter kind of frequency? Yeah. Sometimes you keep rolling it over. So, you know, when you play something with the intention 30 days, you may roll it twice. And then, of course, you've got kind of three months. Um, but but that doesn't always happen like that. You know, we announced another acquisition yesterday. So at some point, we're going to have to pay for that. Uh, and, and that, of course, interacts with our central cash and our overall liquidity and funding picture. So that's that's probably been your kind of the... the typically the duration and the geography and the mm -hmm. currency questions have been typical questions that we had to face. No, it's it's a, it's a very good point, and I think from a from a banking perspective and a lending perspective, actually, there's been a number of different challenges. One is to actually, you know, identify the green loans or the sustainable loans that are there in the first place. And usually, for the largest clients like Unilever, you know, there's very few drawn term loans that 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 can then actually be allocated towards deposits as well. And and I think that the challenge of of having common standards globally to identify to map and then of course do the asset and liability matching exactly as you say is um it's probably also been the similar challenges you mentioned for your team as pioneers i think that's the same challenges that the banks have been going through to try and identify and then ring fence those those assets that we've got such that they can be used to support um green deposits and and sustainable link deposits I know we've only got a, a you know a few minutes left, and I, we we do, we do want have got some um, questions coming in already. But just just one slightly broader question, if I may, Philip. Um, now, Unilever clearly has been at the forefront of ESG sustainability for quite some time. Just maybe this is selfishly and, and def defensive my own position here, but you know how how are you how are you thinking of using your banking partners' ESG credentials? Uh, you know, when you're looking at the relationships that you're developing with your core banks. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, you know, you can look at it either way. You, know, you can you can find a lot of controversy in, in, in how banks are operating in the space of sustainability, but you also find some clear leaders on the topic. So there's a whole range out there. And, and you know, for us, so we, we started last year to, to introduce, um, when we do our annual review meeting with our key relationship banks, we introduced the topic of ESG onto that agenda. So at least we could understand where the different banks are on that journey. Um, it's, it's currently not kind of a formal criteria when we select business or when we run an RFP uh, to, to award business. Um, it's, uh, but uh, I think the time is not in the too distant future where we'll start adding that on and it will become relevant. Um, and, and of course, as, as a matter of principle, you know, when, when, when we go out there as Unilever with this compass strategy that I spoke to at the beginning, uh, that, that speaks of a lot of ambition and an integrated sustainability um, strategy, uh, kind of in our business strategy to kind of this total integration. It's very difficult to, to ignore that when you walk business to supplies, if you take a bank as a supplier of Unilever, yeah. like an agri-food supplier or a packaging supplier, then of course it's relevant across the whole universe of suppliers. So. I think the importance will grow. No, okay, that's thank you, thank you for that. Uh, we've had some interesting questions come in here, and I think uh, being unfair and, and let you do most of the talking so far, Philip. Actually, so maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll take I'll take one of the uh, one of the first questions uh, before coming back to you. Thank you, JP. <laughs> <laughs> the question uh, that's come in on on Slido saying. Uh, 
Um, some ESG purists would challenge the existence of genuine sustainable investment products, given the types of assets most money market funds hold. How confident are you? So maybe I'll answer this, I guess, on behalf of my colleagues and our HSBC asset management team, just to sort of give a view as to, as to how we actually look and assess the, the, the assets that are in those funds. And I am looking at a couple of notes here, so I'm not ignoring, ignoring Philip. I'm just putting off a couple of, um, of comments here. So, so I guess from, from our own ESG money market fund that will be launched later on this summer, actually, it's probably four or five different areas that I know we talk to our clients about that will be used for defining the investment horizon there. So first of all, it's, it's screening. So screening of all the cli underlying clients, or the underlying issuers um, who are in the portfolio. We actually develop a, an ESG score for each asset that goes into the portfolio. Um, we've got a team of internal analysts who are constantly assessing the, the sustainability criteria that we set out. But we also use third party data, including Sustainalytics, which are probably is probably one of the most well known uh, third party providers of information. And then also have active issuer engagement. So I think, you know, it's as Philip said on the, you know, on the general investment um, um, you know, horizon, it's very much something that's developing in nature. There isn't a standard set of criteria out there. But I think that you know, we're trying to be best in class in terms of the way that we actually look at and assess all the investments, all the assets that are going to be going into the, to the money market fund. Uh, one question that might be a, a difficult one for you here, Philip, but I'll, I'll throw it out anyway. So yeah. have you considered the concept of defining and, re and re reporting internally treasury related emissions? Yeah, we, we, we have, we are. Um, to be clear, we, we, we don't currently have that kind of KPI, but, but obviously we looked at kind of, you can look at ESG through different lenses. Of course, activity on the financial markets is one lens, whether it's financing or investing, but if closer to home, you know, how much paper are we using by printing? Um, are we signing a wet paper ink or have we moved to DocuSign? How much do we travel to see our banks in the UK? How often do we invite the banks to come and see us in Switzerland, where we're located? So, you know, these elements that are very close to home, you know, of course, I'm happy to say that I haven't traveled since March 29, uh, 2020. Maybe um, so, that's surprising enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, no surprise to most of us on this call, probably, and the same for everyone. It's been quite hard work to get everything to DocuSign. Um, if I can be honest, you know, a lot of banks found it easy. Others didn't, didn't find it so easy. And of course, that, that makes the process much, much easier when everyone's sitting in a home office somewhere and, yeah. and you lack the central um, kind of infrastructure. Uh, but, but we've got that pretty much. Um, but I think it's a good suggestion. So I'm working with a team currently to define like an ESG treasury roadmap. Um, and I think what, what you mentioned here or what, what the question mentions here is something definitely we, we will be considering how we can quantify that uh, and track it. So it's, I, I think it's a good call out. I do remember Unilever being one of the first clients who, who definitely gave the message to don't come with any any hard books anymore. Please just send them electronically, even if you were, even if we were traveling to Switzerland to see you. Yeah. Uh, another question here, Philip, that touch, touches on something you talked about earlier on, actually. So how much resource is required from a, from a Unilever treasury perspective to monitor the suitability of the ESG investment products? Yeah, so, so we have an increased resource as a result of doing this. I think we kind of, we are trying, and as I've spoken on different occasions, on, in terms of how, to, how do we, get, we certainly get benefits of automation. And, 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 and then we, we get the, the, the ability to redeploy resource. So we've basically freed up capacity in the team by, by getting kind of robotic process, or process automation projects going or automating with a kind of IT infrastructure, treasury management system, et cetera, how it's integrated, how it can kind of auto trade, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and those efficiencies have allowed us to, to, to use extra resource to get these things done and dusted. So okay. it's, you know, it, it hasn't created uh, extra resource requirement. We've used what we have freed up. Oh, very good. Look, I think we've only got 30 seconds left and I think we've still got more questions to, 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 that have been asked there, but unfortunately we're not going to be able to cover those off. Look, I think 
it just leaves me to say, um, firstly, thank you very much to Philip for, for joining me for the session uh, this afternoon. I hope that you all found it um, interesting. You know, I'm sure it will lead to lots more questions and there's more to come on this one. But thank you very much again to Philip. Thank you to everyone who's joined us on the session this afternoon and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks yeah, very thanks, much. Mate. Thanks, Jeppe. Thanks, everyone. And, and uh, an invitation to all my corporate treasury uh, peers, feel free to reach out if you have any questions I would like to discuss further. Thank you, Philip.